Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome. This is another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the most prolific martial arts podcast on the internet. I'm not going to say we're the best. Some people say we're the best. I will undoubtedly say no one makes more episodes than we do. And uh, you can decide whether that is a good thing or not. Tell on today's episode, I'm going to put my hat back on. On today, because I got a little spot right there from wearing my hat. On today's episode, Andrew and I are going to talk about how, careful, trigger warning, martial arts instructors can be the worst self-defense teachers. I've already got some people who are like, rah, 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 rah. some of them are, are rawing in agreement, some are rawing, can be. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about where that can be becomes relevant. Now, if you're new to the show, I am Jeremy Lesniak, Joan, joined by my good friend, frequent co-host, and all-around great guy, Andrew Adams. Andrew, how are you? Hey, Jeremy, how's it going? Heard those finger guns? Yeah, finger guns. I have found that uh, the world is a better place if you have uh, frequent use of finger guns. Yeah. Pew. Pew, (laughs) pew. (laughs) I like how our finger guns make blaster noises as opposed to, you know, something more conventional, like like ammunition. Yeah. Anyway. Because it's more fun to go pew. Because But the world is also better with sound effects. The world is better with sound effects. Try watching a movie without sound effects. What's weird? The sound can be on. The dialogue can be there. But without, like, the audio, like, the music behind it and everything. Ugh, it's, ugh, it's gross. I don't like it. Anyway. This is already my favorite intro we've ever done. If you are if you are new to the show, uh, welcome. You're in for a ride. And some of that ride should carry you to whistlekick.com where you can check out all the stuff that we're doing. We do a ton of stuff. This show is probably the thing we are most known for, but there are so many other things that we do. And I hope that you will go over and, and check out everything at whistlekick.com. You know, one of the things you're going to find over there is our store. We have bills that we pay. And if you buy something in the store, it helps cover those expenses. Uh, Spoiler alert, we're trying to make this a profitable company. And so we keep doing cool stuff that people find value in. And as people find us and they find value, they buy some of the stuff. And we're inching closer and closer all the time. But I'll help you out as you help us out. Use the code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15% on something like this hat or this hoodie or Andrew's t-shirt. Or that's all I think that is nearby that one might purchase. There are plenty of other things over there. Uh, We do events, we do products, we do protective equipment. There's a bunch of cool stuff over there. Our website for this show is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And unlike, I don't know if anybody in the martial arts space does this, but a lot of podcasts put some of their, or most of their old episodes behind a paywall. You, You get, you know, maybe the first 100 episodes for free, but if you want all the old ones, you've got to sign up. Well, I don't know exactly what episode this is gonna be. It's gonna be like, 750 something 750 something okay probably yeah yeah um so if you're new you've got a lot of episodes you can go back and check out we intentionally don't tie our episodes to periods of time because we want the topics that we talk about to remain the term in the industry is evergreen so go check them out check out what we've done every once in a while i get an email from someone i just found your show and i'm i've gone back to the beginning and I'm listening to all of them in order. And I think, man, good luck. That is a daunting task. It's taken us, we're in our eighth year. It has taken Actually, us a long this, time this to will get be, here. This will be 760 something. Oh, okay. So even more. Yeah. Even more. There, there's a lot. We've done a lot of content. And hopefully you like it. And hopefully you like this episode. If you do, buy something. Uh, check out our Patreon shout out and thank you to everybody who contributes to the Patreon. You can get in for as little as $2 a month. Seriously, $2 a month. You're going to get some behind the scenes stuff. Join our uh, <laughs> uh, exclusive Patreon Zoom hangouts and, and just there, we we overload it with value, which is why people don't leave. All right. I think that's a long enough intro. We probably missed some things, but that's okay. Let's Let's dive in. Andrew, martial yeah. arts instructors can be, and I'm reading this intentionally so I get the words right, the worst self-defense teachers. And and there's a little bit of hyperbole with the worst. Martial arts instructors can 
be bad self-defense teachers. Even very good martial arts instructors can be very bad self-defense teachers. Say words. So this topic came to me when my good friend uh, Angie and I were asked to teach a class on Uh, um, self-protection. Personally, and I've talked about this on the show before, I don't like the term Mm. self-defense because it implies you're already involved in an altercation. You're defending yourself. Um, So I like self-protection personally. I I picked that up from Ian Abernathy, actually. Mm -hmm. But the there is a difference between learning martial arts and learning self-protection or what many people call self-defense e, mm. uh, you know even when you get into the actual defense part where someone is you know grabbing you right the, the techniques that you should be practicing and employing in quote self-defense are often incredibly different than how we learn them in martial arts class and I think that's a very important distinction. Yeah. I think because martial arts, any martial arts system that I've ever seen is set out to be something that is trained over a period of time with the vast majority being things that are expected to be trained for many years. I've never met anyone who says my martial arts curriculum is designed to be trained for two years and then I throw you out. Yep. Never heard that. And I think part of what that does is it leads to a valuing, evaluation of complexity that should be rooted in academic understanding, but instead is shoehorned into less academic circles, more practical circles. Here's the best example. Most of us know forms. We train forms of some way. And most of us have seen that somewhere in one of our forms, there's some manner of grab defense, elbow manipulation, joint lock thing that we are doing. And the first time you learned it, you went, oh, that's kind of cool. And then you started maybe to train it with a partner. And you went, huh, okay. This is a lot more complicated than I thought. Is that what one should be building their self-defense or self-protection toolbox around? I mean, I would say likely not. And, And I know we're on the same page. No. And this is where people get themselves, quote, into trouble. Okay. We did an episode recently about uh, what what do we title that one? The one that I'm I'm thinking of. You know the one. I I, I do know the one, but I don't remember what we titled it. Uh, Can you? Do you have that yeah. handy? Was it the the myth one? Yeah. Yep. The myth that bad training makes you worse. So we talked about this, and and this is episode seven fifty five. Seven fifty five. Okay. It's not meant, this is not meant to be a continuation of that, but if you have not listened to that episode, you'll probably appreciate that episode. And actually, I think it's one of the best ones that we've done. So I would encourage people to go back and check it out regardless. We know that those complex movements can work given enough time training. We also know that the more time you train anything, the more, assuming you're training in effective ways, the more uh, variability for which you can pull off that particular maneuver. You know, uh, if if all the conditions have to be perfect, the first time you get it, you train it a couple thousand more times. Maybe you can pull it off when your weight is shifted in a non-ideal way. You're on uneven ground. Uh, you've got the flu, you know, whatever it is. But it is those same movements because we spend so much time with them that a lot of martial arts instructors teach at self-defense classes. All right, come in. I'm going to work with you for two hours and I'm going to teach you these moves that work great and you're going to feel confident and you're going to love it. And a lot of times people leave those classes and they go, what did we just do? What did we just do? Yep. And and I also think that 
as a as someone who goes to a regular martial arts class for years at a time, uh, we will often, and I'm sure every person listening will have likely gone through this type of scenario where you have class and you're going to work, say, wrist grab. Somebody grabs your wrist and then they just stand there and then you do whatever technique it is, mm-hmm. right? And that's fine. And as you do that hundreds of times through your years of training, you learn how to do it from different ways. But Joe Schmo, or it, let's face it, majority of the time, Jane Schmo, who shows up for a self-defense class, learns how to do that technique where someone's just standing there still and just grabs her hand and waits. Well, let's face it. If someone is going to attack you by grabbing your arm, what are they, they're not going to just grab your hand and say, hey, uh, I'm going to be a bad guy. They're going to be doing one of two things. They're either going to be grabbing your hand to pull you somewhere. Mm-hmm. Or they're going to be grabbing your hand to hold on to you so you can't get away and they're going to strike you, right? So within a martial arts context, when you're at school learning for years, you learn how to deal with those other things. But if you have, a, like you said, a two-hour class and you're only training when somebody grabs onto you and just waits there, that's not realistic as to what's actually going to be happening. But a lot of martial arts instructors are so used to teaching students that will be with them for years at a time that they have the ability to teach those other things. And they don't think in this two hour class, I can't teach my self defense class as if it's a regular martial arts class because they are different. Now, most of the people listening will likely think, you know, you're, you're presenting this as if, the majority of martial arts instructors don't recognize this fact. I'm sure they do. Some do. Let me offer a counter example. Andrew, this is what, the third year you've been involved in Free Training Day? Mm -hmm. Free Training Day Northeast, which as we're recording this, it will happen soon. In fact, when this airs, it will probably have just happened the week before. Yep. And we had a great time and you should have been there. (laughs) One of the oh, remember things, that thing happened? Oh, it was so good. Oh, it was so good. One of the things that I have noticed, and I shared this with you, and you, now that you've been involved a couple of years, you've seen this too. We get wonderful, competent, lifelong martial artists to come in and teach. And every year, there are several who are there for the first time and struggle to teach what they are teaching, not to people who are strangers to martial arts, but to other martial artists who have been, the average time training is many years. If people have a hard time breaking breaking down what they're teaching for other people who already do something very similar, they're going to have an even, I, I would say in most cases, a more difficult time breaking it down for someone with, no understanding. Further support for this belief. Does anybody start teaching risk grabs, etc., on day one of a brand new martial arts curriculum? No, not, not because often, it is no. more complex. Well, why don't we give them the stuff that is going to be most useful? Well, we want them to have time to learn skills and to progress and to feel competent about what they're doing. Ah. There it is. We recognize in every way, though we don't want to admit it, that most of what most of us turn to for self-defense, self-protection is inherently complicated. And that's okay if it is for you. But if you're going to teach it to other people, there are two really important concepts that need to be considered and it's funny because uh most of the world knows i do some consulting mostly with martial arts schools but i still have some clients that are not martial arts related uh as an aside if anybody is interested in having me work with you in your martial arts school uh in a very affordable way uh consulting wise boost your numbers boost your marketing i can provide references i'm kind of good at what i do i love doing it if you can't talk but I had this client, we were finishing up a call and this is a client who provides a service and goes into homes. 
And they have a specific scenario where their receptionist heard some things in the background of a call while the appointment was being set up that were relayed to the service provider and is making them uncomfortable. So we talked about this in a couple different ways. The first way being trust your gut, right? Like that that's number one, always trust your gut. But then number two, the body of information that I want to share with her is someone who, to my knowledge, has never done martial arts. Uh, she's older. I believe she's in her late 50s, maybe early 60s. She's just not a, not a uh, big, imposing person. She's not small and frail, but um, I don't think anyone would, would consider her a physical threat. The things I want to give to her are not, okay, here's how you're going to manipulate this wrist if you're grabbed. Here's how I want you to smash the face with an elbow. For a reason that we've talked about on this show several times. Andrew, do you remember what that reason is? Do you know why I don't like teaching that stuff when I teach self-defense? I, I don't remember. I know you've talked about it, but I don't remember. People wait too long. Oh, yeah, yeah. People wait too... If, if all I have, the tools I have available are going to cause injury, I'm going to make really, really sure that I've got the scenario understood. That if I'm going to elbow you in the face, I want to make sure that I don't get it wrong and go to jail. Or, well, is this person just playing around? Yeah. And because of that, people wait. So the things that I teach have to fit a few criteria. And, and I suspect you have your own criteria too. And most of you out there have other criteria. It has to be simple, meaning I can teach it to someone very quickly. It has to be, could kind of go along with that. Some people will break it out separately. Easily replicatable. I need mm -hmm. to be able to do it time and time and time again. And three, non-injurious, meaning that when I do it successfully, that person is not going to go to the hospital. And thus, I am less likely to wait until the opportune time has passed. Yeah. Do you have a similar? Yeah. I mean, I, I, very, very simple. Same, exact same things, right? It's going to be replicatable quickly, um, you know, not injuring. I mean, nobody wants to go to jail. And the reality is that might happen, even when you're defending yourself you know bad things could still happen to you if you quote unquote win um so so i would agree the, the other thing i would i would think about i would add to this conversation is that unfortunately many martial arts instructors advertise and think of themselves as good self defense instructors mm -hmm. not understanding that they're two different things and i think here's here's an, a a great correlation People who go to, who teach boxing advertise that they're teaching boxing and they teach stuff that's very combat adjacent, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're teaching people how to punch and be in a, you know, in, in an altercation boxing, but they don't go around saying that they're teaching self-defense. It's a great point. You know, and I think it is very important for if you are a martial arts instructor and you are teaching quote unquote self-defense classes for women or whomever that you really take a strong look at is what I'm teaching in this two hour, even two day course. Is it really teaching self-defense or self-protection? And the answer could be yes. I think Tony Blauer is a perfect example, right? Someone that yeah. he is teaching how to defend yourself and, and self-protection um, he is not teaching, and I think he would be the first to admit, he's not teaching martial arts. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's an important thing for people to consider. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with saying, yes, self-defense is an aspect of what we teach, but it is not our focus. Correct. Yep. It is okay to say self-defense is something that we teach, but if that is the main reason you are here, we're probably not the curriculum for you. Or we should do some training separately. You know, we can do some private study to help you get those tools faster. I would say that the average traditional martial arts student requires three years of training to take a noticeable step forward in their physical ability to defend themselves. Yeah, I was going to say two to three years. 
Now, there's probably a, a, a much faster return in terms of awareness and confidence and other things that we talked about on episode 755, which is why uh, it's it's fairly quick for someone to gain confidence and to build awareness and all these other things that f for, forget the physical skills for a moment. But in terms of, yeah, somebody throws a punch at me under pressure, my ability to have a better chance, uh, a markedly better chance of defending against that. That is not overnight. That doesn't happen in a two-hour class. There's so much that goes on. If you've ever taught self-defense or, or had scenarios in your martial arts school, and there are people that you look around the room and they're bug-eyed and they need to go sit down or they always choose then to go get a drink of water, it's exactly why. There's trauma there. And most of us have had at least low-grade trauma somewhere along the line that has some impact on what, why, when, how, et cetera, we defend ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. So the premise of this episode being martial arts instructors can be the worst self-defense teachers. Let's end on a high note. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how mm -hmm. should martial arts instructors evaluate their self-defense teaching and if they find that they what what they want to teach is not accurately reflected reflected in how they teach, how they can make some changes. Yeah, so you make a good way to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. And I, I think for me, it, it comes down to uh, your if you are teaching just you are a Joe Schmo teacher just teaching a regular martial arts class every week, two, three, four times a week, whatever. I think. That's fine. You, I don't think you have to change anything. Um, you don't have to necessarily evaluate what you're teaching and how you're teaching it. You teach whatever you want. I th I think the biggest thing that people need to evaluate is if they are teaching a specific self defense class. That's I think that's where it's most important. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think so. And yeah. So the the evaluation process would be the same. If yep. self defense is something you are attempting to teach. The easiest way to test it is to have some high pressure situations. And we've done some drills like that when when mm -hmm. when I we did free training day out in the Northwest. Uh, I think you were there for that that block that I taught. And you know, those are those are not uncommon drills. Anytime someone has unknown stuff to respond to, it can can be really valuable. And maybe we do an episode on on some of these exercises at some point. Actually, that would be kind of fun. We can get maybe a small group together and and do some of these drills as a separate class. But you likely have your own. If you don't, that's a sign that there's an issue. If you don't have drills that you do as part of your self-defense curriculum or would do in a uh, self-defense class, a breakout class, then there is something lacking there and you need to go find them. Um, if the time spent training does not roughly correlate to improvement in those drills, meaning somebody has been there for five years and they're just as good or bad at it as somebody who's been there for a year, broadly, right? You know, look at the breadth of your students. Yep. That is also an indication of problem. People should be progressing as you give them repetition. If they're not progressing with repetition, the repetition is repeating the wrong things. What else? How else might somebody know that they're missing the boat? Uh, I think just trying to make things as realist, quote unquote, realistic as possible in a safe manner, um, I, I think is the most important thing, you know, understanding what's going to what a perpetrator is likely going to do in a situation, you know, just straight grab you by the collar and then wait there is not something that's realistically going to happen. They're going to grab you by the collar because they're going to hit you with the other hand. If you find that what you were doing needs improvement, dramatic improvement, not, oh, I, I could make some adjustments here. Yeah, this makes sense. You know, I probably spend a little too much time on this trail and not on this trail. But if, if you really, if you're going, oh, Jeremy, Andrew, I didn't realize that what I was doing wasn't, it was really not in line with, the goals I have for the people I'm teaching, step one, you probably need a better understanding of violence. 
and what violence is. There are a variety of books. We've done a number of episodes over the years. Uh, we've done two episodes with Tony Blower. We did an episode with Rory Miller. Those are two big yep. names you can look at. We've got a bunch of guests that have written books on violence that listeners would likely find of interest. Um, some people but, likely got those books uh, at Free Training Day. Some of them did. Shout out to the VIPs and the, the bundles. I don't think you're going to find books that are a waste of time. A book on violence, maybe you're not learning a ton of new stuff in it, but I would say that's a good place to start. That's number one. And then number two, build from simplicity. If you consider the goal in educating your students, whether they be from a one-time seminar or re recurring students in a class, the goal of their self-defense education is the noticeable decrease in their risk given any random scenario. Their ability to pull off techniques should be as close to 100 out of 100 in the class setting as possible. And if it's not, if they're not able to pull it out 100 out of 100, is there something better that they could? Right? I've said this before. I'll say it again. The three that I am, the first three that I teach, it's uh, pressing in on the fingernail for any kind of grab. It is pinching the inside of the thigh for any kind of hug. And it is pushing up on the nose for plenty of other things to break balance. None of those are difficult to do. None of those are, are going to hurt anybody. Uh, and then the fourth one, if you need it, this one will hurt somebody. Scrape the bottom of your shoe down someone's shit. Those are the first four things I teach. And people look at that and they're like, that's so easy. Yeah, that's the idea. That's the point. <laughs> that's the whole reason I do it. Did you want something more complicated that you couldn't do in a life or death situation? You're going to have a hard yeah. enough time going, huh, 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 what do I do? Okay, I'm going to push up on their face. Okay, good. That's difficult enough to pull off when you were afraid that you were about to die. Yep. No, oh, I agree. I think we're good. Awesome. All right. Now, as always, we invite feedback. We invite conversation on these subjects. The best place to do it is in our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. It is a private group. You got to join it. And if you join it, you'll have access to the conversations that we have. Some episodes have more conversation than others. Frankly, some of them, we do such an amazing job. We were so articulate and perfectly thought out at the things that we say. People don't have any feedback for us. I don't yeah, think that's, that's the reason, but, but sometimes we have episodes where people don't really have anything to say. But we always welcome it. If it's feedback that you'd like to offer in a more private fashion, you can email us. I'm Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Andrew is Andrew at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio.com. And if there's stuff for follow-up, if there's stuff, you know, sometimes we have people listen. They're like, you know, I really want to unpack this aspect of what you said with you. Yeah, we'll we'll find a way. We'll get you on the show. We're, we're down Absolutely. for that. Yeah. We love including other people. If you want to support us, remember, we've got the Patreon. You can leave reviews. You can buy stuff all over the place. Whatever seems to work for you. If you find value in what we're doing, please consider throwing some value back our way. You know what the number one thing you can do is truly tell other people about what we do. We are a martial arts family. We're a community. We use the word family intentionally. And uh, we're trying to grow the family because a larger family is more resilient. So maybe you know some cool people that should be part of it. Uh, seminars. You want to have me out for a seminar? I'll teach you. I'll teach your students. I'll work with you to customize some of the things that I do for given scenarios. Or you can just say, ah, teach them. And I'll teach them and we'll all have fun doing it. Our social media is at Whistlekick. And that takes us to the end. Until next time. Train, Train hard, hard, smile, smile and, have a, and have a great day. I wait another half a beat for you to come in. It worked. <laughs>